Hello, BookTube. I have a viewer named Christina who's looking at a big milestone birthday, the big 4-0, 40 years old. And she recently asked me if I could make a couple of book recommendations for the year of her birth, 1984. A natural thing that a lot of people want to do, they look at a certain point, they want to look at the books that were printed on, in the year they were born uh, and pick a few and read them. I was automatically happy to do that, but then I thought, mm, what kind of a birthday present would that be? <laughs> Surely, instead of making a couple of recommendations to her privately, I could make a whole video of recommendations to her and all the rest of you publicly. Not only would that give me a chance to look at the publishing year of 1984 in the, le the length and detail that it deserves, but also would give all of you a chance to go into the comments section of this video and wish Christina a happy birthday. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? You know how nice that is when people do it to you. So I thought that's what we'd do. But the first book on our list was not printed in 1984. It just must be on a 1984 list because, to my great alarm, quite a few people have not read it. This is a, a perfect example of the kind of book that people think they've read but they haven't actually read it. And that is, of course, 1984 by George Orwell. It's not a book that came out in 1984, although a million new editions did. But you should definitely read this. And instead of only thinking that you've read it or hearing about it or hearing in the 21st century, hearing things called Orwellian, uh, or maybe looking at a news program uh, that shows you the latest Trump Klan rally with a gigantic screen as big as a football field that just has Trump's face from the nose to the eyebrows. Just that on the screen. So literally a, a parody of 1984. Uh, this is definitely worth reading. In addition to how relevant, unfortunately, it stays, it's also really enjoyable to read, uh, which not every signpost book like this is. Good luck getting through Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, <laughs> for instance. It's an important book, but nevertheless, you wouldn't wish it on your worst enemy. But now we'll go through books that came out in 1984. Some of them, of course. This is, in any given year, well north of 200,000 books are printed in America alone. Uh, so this has to be a thumbnail sketch. But we have some things, quite a few titles that we can go through and say things about one way or another. I've included a couple of titles that came out in 1984 that I didn't particularly like. Some of them I will revisit, some of them I will not. Uh, and I'm sure that I missed a lot. But we'll start off with David Wyman. This is his book, The Abandonment of the Jews. Hard-hitting nonfiction about what FDR's government knew and when it knew that, about what the Nazis were doing to the Jews. And how... how this book draws a stark contrast between how much America knew and how little it did. Uh, bits and pieces of this have been contested by subsequent historians, but I think the, the main gist of it, which is an utter damnation, holds. Very sobering reading, especially when you're, you are taught, maybe you are of the generation who was taught that that was the good war. Uh, very sobering and necessary corrective to that kind of thinking. And then we'll move on to science fiction. This is by John Stakely. I think this might have been his debut. There are a few debuts on this list. This is his great book, Armor, which is military science fiction and military science fiction done really, really well because this is all about uh, the men, the psychology, rather than about the shoot-em-ups. There there's lots of shoot-em-ups in here. This thing either elaborated on or initiated a lot of the cliches of military science fiction, a lot of the, the soldier speak, check your perimeter, check your six, everything done in clicks instead of miles or whatever. Uh, a lot of that stuff that that is now the lingua franca of this particular subgenre of science fiction, a lot of that stuff Stakely actually made or made presentable. Him and Joe Haldeman and a couple of other writers of military science fiction really have never been equaled, and mainly because they go at this more uh, nuanced, in a more nuanced way. This is ordinarily the least nuanced science fiction of them all, but in this case, it's really well done, and it came out in 1984. Also, when we're talking about groundbreaking, we could move from military science fiction to gritty fantasy. To, to fantasy, sci-fi fantasy that is that is gritty and grim, that is now its own subgenre of the grim, dark subgenre. Well, in 1984, The Black Company by Glenn Cook appeared. 
which was unbelievably trailblazing along those lines. This is terrific stuff. This book is every bit as good to read as it was then, never mind the, the dumb cover. <laughs> it has, there's a trade paperback, a much more recent trade paperback, came out about 15 years ago, that is much better. The, the artwork is much better than this. This looks terrible. This whole run, uh, I think this was Tor that did this in 1984, and they, the whole run has ugly covers, but they nevertheless spellbinding stuff. And then we have uh, an award-winning book. This is The Bone People by Carrie Hillman. Uh, a weird. This was this also a debut? Not 100% sure. There, I always lose track of what of which things were debuts. There are a number of them on this list, but this is a reading experience like no other. From the other side of the world, it's well honored in in Australia, New Zealand. It's not as well known here, uh, especially to general purpose readers, especially now in the 21st century. So, well worth your time. It's a braiding of of a handful of personal stories, but beautifully done. Uh, then we have a uh, historical fantasy, a rarity, even now. This is Barry Hoghart. This came out in 1984. This is his novel, A Bridge of Birds, about Master Lee and Number Ten Ox, his gigantic. Uh, hulking assistant. And this is a fantasy version of ancient China. So the more you know about ancient China, the more you're going to appreciate in this book, but you're going to be spellbound anyway. And one effect this book had on people that I, I've recommended this since it came out, I loved it the minute I saw it. The minute I read it, I loved it. I've been recommending it ever since. So that would be 40 years. <laughs> Happy birthday. That would be 40 years that I've been recommending this thing. Uh, and one thing I've noticed is that it tends to, this had sequels, and this and its sequels tend to create a little bit of a yen in people to read classics, of actual classics of ancient China. Nothing wrong with that. That's a wonderful thing. Uh, then we have Jay McInerney. This is Bright Lights, Big City. Uh, stare, uh, a, an absolutely staple work of its time period. I railed against this endlessly when it originally came out, just endlessly, for its self-indulgence and its monomania and its elevation, its worship of all the worst things in the world. There you have the World Trade Center on the cover there. So if you can ever find this vintage contemporary edition, definitely this is the one to have. This is the one that... I mean, the, book, the book was noticed by critics, but this paperback became iconic about a, a, a young guy who it's it's basically following him through his his nighttime odysseys in a now vanished Manhattan that is making a comeback thanks to the fact that Manhattan is now the playground of the super rich and a lot of those super rich people are YouTube influencers in their early 20s so it's become it it, it had a ruthless warlord for a for a decade who removed crime from the city uh, and that is still true so now it's a playground for, for the ultra-rich. It's just a playground for the ultra-rich because the, you're not in any danger. You can just... It practically has a gigantic fence around it. <laughs> so it is possible now for you to go on a bender in lower Manhattan and realize that it's 2 o'clock in the morning and simply wander, weaving and singing and taking selfies on your phone at 3 in the morning all the way up the island of Manhattan without encountering even so much as a rude word. <laughs> This is a totally different Manhattan. I need to go back to McInerney, to, to McInerney and, and, uh, and Ellis and maybe even Tama Janowitz. I need to go back to the, the literary brat pack of the day and see what is there. I really, I really do need to do that. All I remember when I look at things like Bright Lights, Big City or Cannibal in Manhattan is how much I fulminated against them at the time. Uh, then we have something by Robert Swindells. This is not so much well-known. I don't know that I've seen a contemporary reprint of this. This is Brother in the Land. And it's a very good, very moving, surprisingly dark, post-apocalyptic novel about it in the, the wake of, a, of nuclear war. I see people make lists of books like that, featuring things like On the Beach or uh, Alas, Babylon, uh, things like that, or oh, The Last Submarine, even. This book almost never is on any of those lists, but it's it's quite good, and it came out in 1984. Uh, then we have a work of nonfiction by an author who is far better known for his fiction. Uh, the author is John Edgar Wideman, who's terrific in anything that he does. Uh, but in this case, it, this is a piece of nonfiction that he did, Brothers and Keepers, about two young black men who have very different life experiences, one on one side of the law and one on the other. And... If, it, that description, that's a very, it's not, it's an inadequate description. I have to give all these things inadequate descriptions because I want to work in a lot of books. 
for this happy birthday video. <laughs> uh, but even that inadequate description shows you that how easy a thing it would have been to write this in a demagogic way, in, in a very easy way. Weidman never is easy. He never writes easy things. Some of his novels are unbelievably memorable. And this is unbelievably memorable as a work of nonfiction. We are in, we are in nonfiction November, after all. Then another work of nonfiction. This is gigantic. This is the great Donald Keene, who was an expert on all things Japanese literature forever and ever. And he wrote a couple of books on that subject that really, you really shouldn't miss them. This is uh, uh, Dawn to the West, where he, it's a gigantic, sprawling overview of relatively contemporary Japanese literature. This would be dated now, because Japanese literature has rolled on. It is one of the greatest literature bodies of literature in the world. Uh, but this is not just the definitive guide to the in English to the Japanese literature of the time that it covers, but also the way it's done, the way it's a guide. Keen is so austerely knowledgeable on the page uh, that I don't think this is in print, but if you can find a used copy and you're interested in Japanese literature, you'll never have a better primer just sitting there as a reference tool and a recommendation farm. <laughs> Absolutely. And then we have a novel. This is J.G. Ballard. Uh, this is Empire of the Sun. This came out in 1984. Some of you may know it from the insufferable movie, uh, but the the book is. I'm not the world's biggest Ballard fan. This is Ballard writing in a very consciously writing in a different tone and register than most of his other stuff. This is a novel about a boy growing up, you know, in World War during World War II, uh, and it it takes away the quotidian brutality of a lot of Ballard's other writing, and tries, I think, to substitute a kind of schmaltz. I be I don't know much about Ballard. I mainly know him through what I can guess from his works, but I'm guessing that he had that he was looking over his shoulder the whole time he was writing this thing. At something else. I would love to figure out what that something else was. I'm not even quite sure of publication dates. Is it possible that the something else he was looking over his shoulder at was Lord of the Flies? I think I get the impression, I need to reread this book, but I get the impression when, when I read it that he was looking over his shoulder at some kind of book that became beloved and wanted to do that with his own thing. And I guess it worked. Ordinarily, I, I'm a little cynical about authors who write books with the intention of making them beloved classics, but this was embraced more than anything else that he wrote. So it's possible that he succeeded. Uh, then we have uh, not every book on this list is a recommend, and even the books that are recommends are not necessarily recommends for you to jump right in for 1984, because, of course, ongoing series of novels were happening in 1984, and there would be examples of them. This is one of them. This is Far Side of the World by Patrick O'Brien, which was released in 1984. It would not be a recommend for you to start. I would not recommend that you start with this book if you're reading Patrick O'Brien. He really does, I think, intend his, this series this is the Jack Auburn and Stephen Matron series, and I think he intends them to start with Master and Commander, the first book. And I think you'll get a lot more out of them if you do that. He does, Far Side of the World is deeply connected with the events of another, of a contiguous book, so this is an even worse example than usual. There are two set pieces in here that will work on you, but O'Brien is not all that conscientious. Some writers are more conscious than others about bringing you up to speed. He's not all that conscientious. I really think... One critic immortally said that all of the individual volumes in the Aubrey and Matron books really are just chapters in the biggest Jane Austen-style novel ever written. I love that characterization. I didn't like it when I first read it because I thought there's nothing more keyed to dissuade people from trying these books than that. Uh, and I want people to read these books. But I also loved it because it really does capture something that by the time you get to the far side of the world is unmistakable in these books, which is that you're supposed to be reading all of them. <laughs> they're, they're really just sort of burbling on in a story. This is terrific, but I, I don't know that I would recommend it as a, a starting point. Whereas this next one, sure, this is an author who's largely uh, largely fading. That's, that's a bit of a shame. She's always a B-list author, but uh, B-list authors are often where you'll find really enduring treasures. This is Alison Lurie, and this is her book, Foreign Affairs. A strange novel for her. I, I don't know that she quite so baldly pursued any of these themes the same way in any of her other books. The main character in this book is 
she's she's an, an American academic in in the UK. She loves the UK, of course, as American academics tend to do, and feels like she knows it. But of course, it is an alien land, and she has a, a weird, spiky hate love relationship with a critic in the UK. I don't know. I really need to reread this book. I really do. I really need to reread all of Alison Lurie because she is really good. Uh, same thing with another author on this list. It really, decidedly B-list, but well worth the time to find and read. Uh, after all, most readers, you know, live in the B-list and, and, the, and they get a rewarding reading lifetime out of that. I really need to reread all of her works and reread this one with, with a particular eye towards seeing whether or not this thing was her response to the women's movement. The more I think about it, the more I think it could be. But uh, but I, I, it came out in 1984, so I wanted to include it. Only a handful of books on this list are 1984 publications that I have reread and reread and reread and know them like the back of my hand. Most of them are on this list. I've read them, but I haven't studied them. Foreign Affairs I thought was terrific, but I need to go back to it. Whereas this next book, I don't know how many times I've read this. <laughs> this also came out in 1984. This is Heretics of Dune by Frank Herbert. There we have, I, I had a number of covers to choose from when I was pulling these off the internet, and I picked this one because this is my favorite cover, or what a cover that is. Uh, this is a later novel in his Dune series, so again, like with Far Side of the World, I wouldn't recommend that you start with this book. I wouldn't recommend, this is not a, a blanket recommend for a 1984 book. There are a handful of those. We can go over them at the end of the video. 1984 by George Orwell, of course, is, is one of those. And there are a few others on this list. This would not be one of them. I just had to mention it because it, I love it so much. I just love it so much. There are so many scenes, and there are some inadvertently hilarious lines in The Heretics of Dune. By this point in the series, uh, Herbert had really refined his narrative style when it came to Dune to a point where I don't want to say that it's like a keep out sign to non fans, but I honestly don't know what a, what I think it would be insane to try to read this book without reading the other Dune books. I think that would be insane. And ordinarily, I would say that that is a great demerit for the author, but I can't do it with this book. I can't say that about this book because I love it so much. Then we have another another B list author is well worth your time to find and explore. That author is Anita Bruckner. This in 1984 came out her book Hotel de Lac which I think is her best thing, but two lonely souls finding each other in the last place on earth they expect to. So in that way, very similar to Foreign Affairs. A sparsely written thing, very, very good. Uh, well worth a reread on my part. A lot of these things are. Uh, this next one, I'm sure that I will reread it before I die. Uh, I'm sure that I will. I've read it a few times. I know it fairly well. This came out in 1984 and took the world by storm. This was The Hunt for Red October by Tom Clancy, which... He could not find anyone interested in this book. It's, and you only have to read a, a couple of chapters of it to see why. Calling it woodenly written is an insult to trees all over the world. <laughs> Calling it fond of info dumping. Oh my God, the, the whole thing is an info dump. You read it and you don't... You, I first read this in 1984 and I remember thinking, what the hell is this? I don't even know what this is. It doesn't read like anything else I've ever read. Now, for good or ill, I think this book did a lot of ill, but for good or ill, it is valuable and important, I think, to con for me anyway, to continually read books that don't read like anything else I've ever read. And this was definitely one of those. This kicked off an entire subgenre of Clancy-esque books. This paved a pathway in the woods on its own story. Of course, you know the story because you know the movie. It's a terrific movie. That was made out of this book. Uh, this is the story of a Russian submarine captain who wants to defect in the gaudiest way possible with his submarine and all of his crew. Um, and the heroic agent, uh, the, the heroic analyst, Jack Ryan, who has to go and figure out what's going on, is literally the man in the middle. Uh, what to say about The Hunt for Red October? I could make a whole video about it. It is effective. In its way, it is effective definitely. And it's one of the most, in, in terms of literature, in terms of literature, it's one of the most important books to come out in 1984. So it definitely belongs on this list. Then we have Elizabeth Griffith. Uh, this is a book that I think has gone out of print. I think it's largely forgotten, but this is in her own right. This is a, an incredibly spirited biography of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was a 
a proto-feminist, a women's rights advocate at a time when that could get you arrested, at a time when that could get you beaten in the streets. Uh, she was a remarkable figure, eloquent, fearless, funny, steeply intelligent, uh, incredibly friendly. Not the word you think of when you think of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, but uh, uh, she, she is a figure in the movement to give women the same legal rights as men. She, which seems like, it seems like such a, you know, a nonsense, uh, such a simple thing, so obvious that it doesn't bear saying, and yet it isn't true in most of the world. It isn't even still completely true in America. And in Elizabeth Cady Stanton's day, it wasn't even remotely true. And she looked around her like her fellow activists, like Susan B. Anthony and whatnot. She looked around and said, why on earth is that? Why on earth should that be true? When I ask you why I don't have the same rights as you do, you aren't going to tell me it's because of a Near Eastern religious text from 2,000 years ago, are you? Are you going to tell me that's the reason I can't have a bank account on my own is because of the Bible? <laughs> I, long before this book, I thought what, we, what she really needs is a great 20th century biography. And in this book, oh boy, does she get it. This is a great 20th century biography. Uh, okay, then we have a gigantic work of historical fiction. I've been around the block with this thing. I originally kind of sort of liked it. And then I read a lot of what its own author said about it and thought, okay, you hoodwinked me. Good for you. I'm never going to treat this the same way again. I'm never going to like this book again. And I'm going to like you a lot less. Because, you know, ten martinis in before you talked with Dick Cavett or whoever, you were willing to blurt out the truth about this book. Now, looking back, I don't know what to believe about any of those interviews. So I'm going to just do what I should have done at the beginning and treat the book on its own, on the page. And that is Lincoln by Gore Vidal, a massive historical novel about Lincoln during the American Civil War. This is 800 pages long, and uh, it's quite good. Vidal often disparaged, once it, it, it achieved a certain amount of commercial success, he did what he always did with any success of his or anybody else's, which is to immediately undercut it. He couldn't help himself even when it was his own success. So he started saying in interviews and talk shows and whatnot that this was a left-handed exercise, that it was a, a, an exercise to see how much garbage the reader could be forced to swallow, an exercise to, to play the critics. I'm playing the critics. I want to see if I can get the critics to sit up and call this monumental. So I decided to make it look that way, even though I don't care about it. I shouldn't have paid attention to that. I was touchy because I was a critic at the time, but... You should only judge the book and not whether or not the author is a raging a-hole. And the book was not tossed off. This is not a left-handed exercise. Anything that Gore Vidal said along those lines was simply false. Uh, I recently found a modern library hardcover of this thing, a nice squat brick of a modern library of this thing, and gave it a reread and found it pretty impressive. Uh, so a 1984 book from Gore Vidal, one of his last pretty impressive books. So well worth it to be on this list. Then we have uh, Louise Erdrich. I'm pretty sure this was a debut. Um, if I remember correctly, this is her, her book, Love Medicine. Uh, terrific, heart-wrenching book, really centering on the, the, uh, the Native American Indian experience in the contemporary world. A couple of standout characters, one in particular who's one of the most tragic 20th century characters in a novel that I've read. Uh, one critic at the time very neatly said that it's the beauty of the book that makes the tragedies bearable. Otherwise, it would be unbearable to read. Uh, I really need to give this and a couple of her other books uh, a new reread. A this is another example, like a lot of things on this list, of 1984 titles that I haven't really revisited in any substantive way since then. Because, of course, 1984 was just a few minutes ago. <laughs> it was just a few minutes ago. So I, I, I really need to give this a, a, a relook. Same thing with this next one. This next one was propelled onto my mind just recently. This is Jane Ann Phillips. This is her great book, Machine Dreams, about a couple of generations of people in, living in, you know, on the border of dirt poverty in West Virginia. Uh, this elicited Hosanna's of Praise when it first came out. I was part of those Hosanna's of Praise. Uh, it's possible that some critics who reviewed this when it first came out were writing under pen names. How horrifying. <laughs> but recently, I haven't reread this. Since, I know a couple of people, this is their favorite novel. And I, I haven't reread this really since then. 
And recently, Dwight Garner of the Eminence Greece at the at the New York Times started a review of Jane Ann Phillips' new book by saying how horrible it was. And in the course of that review, just offhandedly mentions the same genuflection toward machine dreams that everybody else has. That that was a great book. This new one is not. Uh, and regardless of what I thought about that as an estimation of Jane Ann Phillips' new book, it automatically made me think of this thing that I need to go back. This was a, this was a as you can see, a pretty strong year for fiction. Uh, for American fiction. Uh, then we have uh, a big sweeping study. This is Barbara Tuchman's The March of Folly. Uh, this is her book. This wasn't what it looked like originally. I just love this cover. This is uh, her book about governments, and by extension populations, operating against their own self-interest. Why do nations do that? Why do nations do something like Vietnam? Why do nations do things that are against their own self-interest? And I, I loved this at the time. I thought it was a little bit vague, a little bit uh, underfed. Uh, of course, at the time that I was reading this, in 1984, I had not the slightest conception that the, the phenomenon of people and governments acting against their own self-interest would not only continue, but flourish. I had no idea of that. I, like everybody, thought... Well, the more examples we get, the more the examples come to light, the more scolding books like this we get, the less likely we'll be to do that. I could not be any, I, that could not have been more wrong. <laughs> that just could not have been more wrong. 2015, 2016, the American presidential campaign featured the Republican frontrunner whose main campaign speech at every whistle stop, at every rally was, if you vote for me, I'll take away your health care. <laughs> <laughs> and people loved it. They voted him into office. At every point, he said, if you vote for me, I will take away your health care. <laughs> and it still hasn't ended, right? Not to, not to contextualize this video too much, but right now, the government, the far-right Trumpist government of Israel, is right now engaged in an action that is unbelievably against its own long-term self-interest. Anyone could see that. A blind man could see it, and they're still doing it. So this book is, I hate to say it in reviewer speak, more relevant than ever. <laughs> it's also, and Barbara Tuckman is very readable. If So if you are looking to read something, you know, work a sweeping work of history, this will do very well. <laughs> uh, then, uh, we have another contemporary novel. This is very much along the same lines as Bright Lights, Big City. There was a, a current running through the fiction of the 1980s that you see reflected in quite a few of its signature books. And this is one of them. This is another one that I need to revisit. It was Dwight Garner who pushed me, who pushed me to reread Machine Dreams. And it's Joe Spivey. The book two for Joe Spivey will push me to reread this. This came out in 1984. This is Money by Martin Amos. I read this when it first came out. Uh, lambasted it in print, said that it was a, a scabrous act of navel-gazing that just never stops. Amos puts himself in this book famously as a character, but also all the rest of it is just grubbified. Everything in this is grubbified and dragged through mucky gutters. And at the time, I thought, well, how awful. And looking back, I view that 1984, Steve, as a critic, saying, well, okay, but that's what the author's trying to do. <laughs> you can't criticize the book for being the book he wanted to write. <laughs> you have to instead analyze it on its own terms. If you're going to criticize him for wanting to write a book like this, well, then become his father confessor. But don't be a book critic. <laughs> you know? So I need, I hate to say this, I never thought, oh my God, all through the 90s, if you told me there ever come a time, if you, first of all, in the in 1980s, if you told me that I was going to be alive in 2023, I would have said, no, none of us are going to be alive in 2023. Uh, but, like, in 1984, I thought it was incredibly cool that I had lived long enough to read, to reread George Orwell's book, 1984. But even at the time, I remember thinking, well, these science fiction novels that I'm reading that are set in the you know, in the 2000s. I won't live to read those. 2001 by Arthur C. Clarke, there's no chance. None whatsoever. Uh, looking back on that critic, I now feel like I need to do something which in the 90s, in the 80s, I would have said, absolutely not, it will never happen, which is a systematic reread of Martin Amos, of all people. Oh God, I can't believe I'm even saying it. But his last book, Inside Story, is brilliant. It is genuinely great. 
And it's not all that substantially different from from any of the rest of the stuff. The stuff that he did when he was an enfant terrible. It's not terribly different from that. Which means there may be greatness in these books that I'm just missing. He, uh, Martin Amos is one of Joe Spivey's favorite authors. And Joe Spivey is... is He's no dull. He's not a dullard. <laughs> so there must be something here. Certainly, he's not the only one. I've known. I knew critics at the time who sang the praises of this thing and told me to my face over wine and calzones at the Hyde Cottage of the day, surrounded by beagles, uh, that I was just missing something. That I was just missing something. And not a lot of critics. Not a lot of my literary friends will tell me that because it's usually not true. Uh, usually, they're the ones missing something. Uh, but I had people say that to me at the time. So <laughs> maybe I need to do that. This came out in 1984. Any Martin Amos is all Martin Amos, so it's a good place to start. Then we have a classic, a classic of fantasy that came out in 1984. This is Robert Holstock. This is Mythago Wood. A, a, a classic of uh, the British fascination with woods <laughs> that you see running all through Tolkien. This is a, I won't even call it an update of that. It's not really an update of that. It's a lovely, lovely thing. This, I think, is a, a new cover, and I think it also got another new cover for the Fantasy Classics series that you can get as a trade paperback. So this is this is well served. It's not as gone as some of the things on this list. Ah, okay. Well, then we have uh, an absolute classic, much in the way that uh, John Stakely bla blazed ground with military science fiction, Tom Clancy blazed ground with the techno thriller. This thing also blazed ground. This is Neuromancer by William Gibson. Which started really, I mean, I know that the, the, the hipsters will quibble, but this, in a mainstream way, really kicked off cyberpunk as a subgenre. Uh, I don't know the, quite the, the health and the pulse of cyberpunk today because we're living in a cyberpunk world. You wear an Apple Watch, <laughs> for Pete's sake. So, uh, but most people don't have smart implants yet. So, uh, and, and, the point that I want to make about Neuromancer, of course, Neuromancer is the it's the go-to book. If you talk about cyberpunk, this is a book that's going to come up. Uh, but the point I want to make about this book is how beautifully it's written. It's it's a beautiful reading experience. Whether you care about cyberpunk or the the whole subgenre or the the wave or the movement or anything, it's lovely, absolutely lovely. Gibson has written beautiful books since here, but he's never written any more beautiful prose than what's in here. So. It gets a strong recommendation no matter where you stand in, on science fiction. And when it comes to beautiful prose, our next author kind of takes the cake. <laughs> this is One Writer's Beginnings by Eudora Welty. A slim thing that is a collection. This is a book collecting some, some lectures that she did, some essays that she did about her own uh, youth, her, her upbringing as a writer, as a reader, as a girl in the American South. I am a huge Eudora Welty fan, but even I have to admit that the sheer amount of magic in this book excels the sheer amount of magic in almost anything else that she did. This was, every once in a while, a great writer will find a subject, will get uh, will get asked to treat on a subject or to write about something that is perfect. It's a perfect match at the perfect time, and they capture a unique kind of magic. You see that. I recommend books like that all the time. A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf is an example of that. Uncommon Reader by Alan Bennett, another perfect example of that. This is, a, is one of the foremost times I would say that ever happened to Eudora Welty. I cannot recommend it strongly enough. <laughs> no matter what you think, no matter whether you think you're, that you like reading autobiography or not, I cannot recommend it strongly enough. Then we have uh, another book in a series. Remember I mentioned that series were ongoing throughout the 1980s and 1990s and to our day. Uh, and some are more hospitable than others. The Aubrey and Matron books by Patrick O'Brien are not really hospitable. You can't really jump in on the far side of the world if you're going to get the most out of the series. Others are more hospitable, especially if, for instance, they are murder mystery series, where the whole point is that you have to bring new readers up to speed all the time. And 1984 saw The Pilgrim of Hate by Ellis Peters, uh, which is one of her brother Cadfile mysteries. It's late in the series, but you could easily pick this up and love it even if it was your first Brother Cadfile mystery. Cadfile was a soldier, went on crusade, then decided to abjure that life and become a monk. And uh, this this book is one of the first times that Ellis Peters decides to bring the world of the crusades back to, to Cadfile in a big way, to bring the, the world of pilgrimages back to Cadfile in a big way. These are wonderful. They're set in medieval England, and they are wonderful. 
any of them are wonderful. You could pop in at any point and love them all. Uh, then we have a work of history, a work of history and biography, one of the greatest works of 1984. This is Evan S. Connell. This is his book, Son of the Morning Star. And this is his book about George Armstrong Custer and the Battle of Little Bighorn. But it reaches its conclusion in a spiral kind of direction. So it requires patience. This is the work of a master craftsman. Evan S. Connell labored over every sentence, every paragraph, cared very much about where everything was and when it happened in the story. It will give you a feel of authorial control that, to put it mildly, you don't encounter much these days. <laughs> and so this is a, the story of the Little Bighorn, the Battle of Little Bighorn. But the Battle of Little Bighorn lasted, as one Sioux eyewitness said, about as long as it takes a man to eat his lunch. Didn't last a long time. And this is this is not a short book. This is like 400 pages long. And the reason why is because you are Connell is entwining the stories of Custer and his men and his brother and the Sioux, in order to get you to Bighorn, to, live, to the Battle of Little Bighorn, when it will make sense to you, in a way that will make sense to you. It's gorgeous. Just fantastic. Utterly gripping. So, one of the best books of this year, back to back here, because One Writer's Beginnings is a ten, it's a tenth this size, and a completely gentle thing, whereas this is an increasingly violent book. But two Titanic volumes right there. Uh, anyway, not a Titanic volume at all. I wouldn't be surprised if this was also a favorite author of Joe Spivey. This is uh, Kingsley Amos, Martin Amos's father. This is Stanley and the Women. Kingsley Amos wrote novels regularly. He came out with almost one a year at, at this time period in 1984. And they're good. They're a little weak. They're a little wishy-washy. And they... Stanley and the Women is a good example of that. If you if you know Kingsley Amos only from his masterpiece, Lucky Jim, you're going to see echoes of it in a lot of his later works, and only that. Lucky Jim has a kind of coherence to it that is not present in Stanley and the Women. Like Lucky Jim, this thing has precisely two comic set pieces. And as with Lucky Jim, uh, the two comic set pieces in this book are absolutely immortal. They are absolutely incredible. It's just, you want the rest of it to sort of stitch it together. And you don't always get that with Kingsley Amos. Uh, okay, then we have, uh, pretty sure this was a debut. This is Harriet Dorr. This is Stones for Ibarra, a novel about a copper mine. Uh, very much drawing from the author's own autobiography. But a delicate thing, a small thing, like Hotel du Lac, a short novel. Uh, elegantly written, elegantly considered. Something that will stick with you, especially the conclusion, will stick with you. Uh... I don't know if this is still in print. don't know if Dora is remembered, but uh, well worth it. And I had to include a couple of books on here that I'm not all that wild about. Stanley and the Women is one. This is another one. I'm in the minority, definitely. I don't think this author is, is a candidate for a systematic reread anytime soon. I was giving him concerted attention as his books were appearing in English translations and not liking them for lots of seriously considered reasons. So I don't think I owe Milan Kundera a, a reread, but this is, of course, his big book. This is The Unbearable Lightness of Being, which came out in 1984. Uh, love Among the Ruins, <laughs> Love Among the Tanks. Uh, people have fallen under the spell of this book. I have not. I knew people at the time. I knew critics at the time. This was universally hailed. It was on every year-end list. I, it never did anything for me. I thought it was a little bit ham-handed. In fact, a lot ham-handed. I'd love to know if you are one of those people who fell under this spell. But... I couldn't, I couldn't not put it on the birthday list because it might work uh, for somebody other than me. Then this next one, another book in series. This one is a little bit more hospitable to jump on than Far Side of the World, maybe a little less hospitable than Alice Peters. This is a, the, one of the Spencer novels of Robert Parker. This is Valediction. Uh, Spencer was a Boston P.I., uh, poetry quoting Boston P.I. Boston is fairly well captured in some of these books. Robert Parker himself was an absolute darling of a man wonderful to sit and talk with just wonderful uh for uh, just endlessly you could sit and talk just endlessly full of laughter very different personal register than the register of the books themselves i don't think most people would associate joie de vie and laughter with the spencer books valediction is a slightly more ambitious spencer novel than most of them i probably the high watermark of that of that ambition in this series i I know a lot of Spencer fans. A lot of them really like this particular entry in the series. So if hard-bitten pre-internet private eye novels are especially location-heavy, Boston is a very active character in these books. This is a 
if that's a sweet tooth of yours and you don't know Robert Parker's Spencer books, you definitely should know them. Uh, okay, this next one is serious literature. I think the most serious thing this author ever did, and certainly one of the most serious books to appear in this year or in this decade. A little bit hard to recommend. It's extremely complex and long, so I don't know how much of a recommendation this would be. This is the English language translation of The War of the End of the World by Mario Vargas Llosa. This is not my favorite Mario Vargas Llosa novel in either English or in Spanish, but it it is powerful. It is powerfully complicated and complex about a weird civilization, a weird city that tries to live outside of not only the, the norms of the, the rest of the world, but the norms of human civilization just in general. And of course, it's based on real life. And that uh, any city that tries to live like that is going to be the object of relentless violence and hatred on the part of states. <laughs> and there are, there are characters in here who... Uh, I, I still don't know what to make of this thing. I found this trade paperback copy a few years ago. I think I hauled it on this channel. I gave it a reread. And one of the only times... Where this, the re rereading this, I read this when this trade paperback first came out in 1984. And then I reread this translation just a couple of years ago, and it was one of the rare instances where I thought, you know, maybe just this just isn't translatable. Maybe that's just the case that's going on here. I am a huge fan of English language translations, quite apart from the books that they translate. I'm a big fan of that as an action, as an industry, as a way of books appearing in the world. I'm a big fan of that. I find it fascinating. I always have. Uh, and I'm usually a champion of them. Usually I'm a champion of translators. Usually I'm saying, despite what linguists say, or maybe in, in accord with what linguists say, anything can be translated. It just requires the right translator with the right, the right fluency, the right often capaciousness in terms of the, their reading in the target language. Often that is true. I, I, I always just cringe when 21st century translators say that they don't read widely in English. Now, I'm going to translate this work from the Catalan or the French or the, the Uzbekistan. I'm going to translate it from that work because I'm a blue-haired SJW and I think you're all racist. You're all racist for not only reading the works of one corner of, of southeastern Uzbekistan. All the greatest writers came from that one corner. I don't care about the ancient Greeks. I don't care about Shakespeare. They're all colonialist imperialists. So you should only be reading that corner of that country. And if you're not, you're a racist, and I hate you. But I'm going to translate this work as an as an effort of a social justice crusade. But I don't do any reading. <laughs> I don't I don't read any of these books that I hate. I always cringe when I see something like that from a translator because that means your translation will be bad. Maybe, I'm not saying that, I don't remember offhand who translated this into English. Maybe that's true in this case, but it may be that I need to do a systematic reread of Mario Vargas Llosa, and just this once, maybe I need to do it without translations, which always feels a little weird. <laughs> uh, and then we will we will finish up, before I give my, uh, my number one recommendation, we will finish up with, again, I'm putting books on this list, some of which I don't like. I didn't like The Unbearable Lightness of Being, and I don't like John Updike. But it's impossible to make a list from 1980s without John Updike. His book was The Witches of Eastwick, which is just more ham-handed, uh, insinuating sexism. It's just, it's just, the gist of the, uh, maybe I need to reread it, but the gist of this book, as the gist of all Updike's books, seems to me to be the same as the gist of all the other mid-20th century sexists, the misogynists who ruled the literary list at the time which is that women are kind of quaint and quirky and funny, but what they really need and what they secretly or not so secretly want is a man to tell them what to do. Uh, even if that man is the devil and they're a witch's coven. I just, uh, it just no. <laughs> no, I can't imagine myself giving John Updike a systematic reread. I really doubt that that will happen. Some of the other authors on this list, yes. Alison Lurie, yes. Anita Bruckner, yes. Maybe even Yosa? Margaret Vargas Llosa, maybe, but not in English, uh, but not not John Updike. But I had to include it on this birthday list, which I see has gone long. <laughs> so the one other book that I want to mention here, roughly triangulate to 1984, and I will say The Book of Merlin by T. H. White, which I I want to strongly recommend to end this. I want I want to start with a book that isn't quite a 1984 production, and I want to end with that as well. The Book of Merlin 
is amazing. And I want to strongly, strongly recommend it, even though it's not precisely on target. Uh, and there you go. That is a happy birthday turning 40 list of books uh, that came out in 1984. Most of them came out in 1984. I'm only now realizing that what I should have done was make sure this video was 40 minutes long and make sure that it had 40 books. <laughs> I don't know how many books we did, but I don't think it was 40. But anyway, that is the literary world in America of 1984 in a nutshell. So as a happy birthday, <laughs> as a happy birthday gift, and of course a gift that, that we can share with the rest of you as well. There you go. We will do this for other years as other birthdays come to bear. <laughs> but I'm going to wrap this up for now. Sorry for the length. And I will see you soon. Thank you.